Okay. So hopefully I answered the question. Uh, it's a very, very good question. Uh, all right. So uh, the conclusion here is that if you have a uh, um, a very simplistic channel, uh, it's too clean, uh, then you're not going to get the benefits out of multiple antenna type uh, technology is what you might think. Uh, it does require, kind of takes advantage of a messy environment. So, okay, so let's move on and start looking at 5G. Uh, as we do this, uh, we're going to look at maybe some of the the key issues in 5G that we're trying to tackle in modern mobile communication systems, wireless systems in general. And uh, then we will um, look at the uh, kind of basic waveform that's used here. And so uh, the the neat thing about this uh, is that uh, basically everything we've been looking at uh, so far in the semester is all going to kind of come together here. And um, um, and that's why I think it's worth spending uh, some extra uh, sessions on this as we look at it. So, all right. So uh, there are a number of 5G use cases and design goals and constraints and requirements and that type of thing. Um, the big ones that we're interested in are this EMBB, the Mobile Broadband Connectivity, uh, especially focused on high data rates. We all want uh, faster data and um, uh, that that type of thing, right? So uh, be able to watch higher def uh, videos and, and whatnot. So uh, this also, so this is our basic usage of cell phones that we that we're used to. Um, we're uh, realizing that, Hotspot connectivity is a bigger deal uh, than it was originally. And we're looking at uh, wide area coverage. Uh, I know we we haven't really talked about cell networks in general and how they're different from point-to-point -point networks or broadcast networks, uh, that type of thing. But um, uh, we'll talk a little bit about that on Friday. But uh you have, you know, I think we're all familiar with uh, the concepts enough is that, you know, we have multiple cell phone towers. Uh, a tower is uh, communicating over a certain range and is supporting a certain number of users with a certain amount of traffic, right? So um, uh, in some areas, we're coverage limited. And, you know, maybe upstate and the Catskills at the Adirondacks, you don't have that many users, but you're trying to cover a lot of area and some difficult terrain, right? And so uh, there you're putting up high powered stations trying to cover a lot of, lot of range. And because um, uh, it's expensive to actually put up stations out there and run uh, fiber backhaul to them to connect into the network and that type of thing, right? So we're looking at uh, coverage limited type of systems. In uh, urban areas in a city, you're gonna be more capacity uh, limited, capacity constrained. And um, so each uh, base station is trying, to, uh, is less concerned about uh, trying to reach out miles and miles. And actually you're dealing with small cell sizes, but uh, the focus is more on supporting as many users with as much uh, traffic or, or bandwidth as, as possible. So um, then also another distinct use case is this ultra reliable, low latency communications, uh, UR LLC. And uh, you can think of this for uh, machine control, like real time machines, uh, things that are moving, uh, uh, that type of thing. An example is, uh, remote medical surgery, right? Where the surgeon is not co-located with the patient and they're trying to do some uh, surgery, controlling a, controlling a machine. And uh, so you've got to make sure that your latency is really low 
um, and also that it's uh, it's for reliable, right? So, uh, <laughs> yeah. No, you're good. I just sneeze. Okay. Uh, so autonomous vehicles is a uh, similar type of thing, um, uh, especially when they're uh, communicating with other vehicles to understand uh, what's happening there. Uh, smart grid, distributed automation. Um, so these type of things, right? So um, then there's also M MTC, a massive machine type communications. Still dealing with machines, but now we're we're not trying to control those machines in real time. We're trying to gather data from them. A uh, project I worked on a few years ago for New York uh, uh, City Department of Health was uh, monitoring for uh, mosquito concentrations. Uh, this is back when the the Zika. Uh, virus was a big concern, particularly for pregnant women uh, and the birth defects that it would cause, right? So it's a big deal in South America and it, it came up here and we were concerned about, um, you know, the public health. And so uh, I helped build a system that would monitor in real time uh, mosquito concentrations and, um, you know, trying to figure out is that, is that, the type of mosquito that carries the Zika virus, right? And then to report that data wirelessly. Well, we didn't need to know exactly when that mosquito fell into the trap, um, but we wanted to be able to communicate that information uh, effectively and uh, wirelessly so that we don't have to send someone out to monitor each one of these traps all the time, right? So uh, that's a great use case for this, uh, unfortunately it wasn't available then. Uh, so we uh, had to use the more expensive, just regular connection, right? But uh, the idea is that well, we're only sending a few bytes every now and then, uh, why should I pay you know, a regular cell phone subscription when I'm only using a tiny bit of data? So um, that would be you know, a case where delay is not critical, and low traffic volume, maybe you're sending a few bytes, you know, 100 bytes or so uh, once a day or a couple of times a day, right? So uh, so these are very, very different use cases that we're trying to solve with 5G uh, with the same basic communication system. So uh, we need a system that can be quite flexible. Uh, both at the base station and being able to design different modems uh, for the uh, different, you know, focused on different use cases uh, and still do it efficiently, right? So um, in this last case, again, there's a lot of uh, situations where you'd like to communicate data, but you can't, uh, can't justify uh, spending, you know, uh, $50 a month for a, a cell phone connection for every single uh, IOT, you know, Internet of Things device you have out there, you might have hundreds or thousands of them, right? So, um, so we want a system that can uh, not not only technically handle all these things, but also provide for reasonable business cases for these, right? So, if we can solve this, like last one, for example, uh, and be able to do it so that maybe the price of a connection is a dollar instead of $50, then uh, then suddenly that becomes practical. And uh, now we can have uh, a business built around that. Whereas if uh, you know, you're having a price at $50 and no one's gonna buy it type of thing, right? So, um, all right, so just uh, a few, there's uh, actually, there's some nice diagrams that show all sorts of different uh, considerations for 5G design. Uh, but I'm just going to hit on the big ones, right? So we want increased spectral efficiency. Um, you know, when uh, new spectrum gets auctioned by the FCC, uh, and they're, they're typically getting this spectrum from other spectrum users. For a while, it was uh, TV when we moved from analog to digital TV. Uh, but a lot of it comes from the military as they 
uh, decide, well, we don't need this radar band anymore or something, and uh, we can convert that over to uh, cell phone uh, systems or something like that, right? And the FCC will run an auction, and uh, you know your Verizons, at and T's, T-Mobiles of the world will um, will bid on these things, and they will spend billions of dollars for nationwide coverage. So um, your uh, Lost the spectrum is a significant part of your cell phone bill. So obviously we want to maximize our spectral efficiency. We want to use that very expensive uh, resource as efficiently as we can, right? Um, we have a lot of complex uh, multipath channels. Uh, and uh, now 5G is not just working in you know, uh, the gigahertz, two gigahertz range, we're expecting it to work in millimeter wave uh, frequencies and tens of gigahertz and and, and all. So, um, so that uh, system needs to be able to adapt to very, very different uh, type of scenarios. We need to flexibly support many users with diverse use cases. And that was what that previous slide was about. And, while we do all this, we still need to manage our handset complexity, our cost uh, of those, and the base station itself too, and uh, and battery life. Right. So, um, actually, energy at the base station is a big concern too. That's a non-trivial cost for carriers to uh, provide electricity. Uh, so there's a big push to have very efficient uh, base stations. But it, uh, it becomes really apparent in, in a handset if it only works for a few hours before you have to recharge it. I think I saw an Apple ad about their laptop being able to uh, go from, you know, on a uh, plane from New York to Singapore for 22 hours or something like that, right? So uh, uh, obviously you're not communicating when you're on the flight, but uh, uh, battery life is a big is a big deal, so we all know. So, um, all right. So those are some of the considerations that we have to deal with. Um, you know, one of these is how do we support all these different users simultaneously, right? So uh, we don't want to have to wait for uh, someone to finish talking on their conversation before we get to use a channel, right? So we're we're always supporting multiple users at a time. Um, how does a radio network support that well we kind of touched on this a little bit um but uh one way is tdma time division multiple access basically you know at a really high level we send some packets for user one and then we send some packets for user two and so on and so on and so on and then we cycle back to user sending packets for user one um we do this fast enough that users don't notice any delay. Um, and so we're, we're sending just a few packets for user one, few packets for user two and, and, and so on. So, um, and in some ways we can actually divide up that packet for multiple users, but we're um, basically allowing different users to talk at different times, right? So they're not colliding on top of each other. We can also use frequency division multiple access, and uh, that's where you might uh, assign different users different frequency channels to talk on. And uh, it, with the right filtering and right channel spacing, we can all talk at the same time, and uh, no big deal. I mean, a trivial case of this is your FM radio band, where you have lots of different uh, radio stations, but they're all transmitting on different frequencies. And so we use filters and a receiver to separate all those out, right? So um, uh, then we we talked in our spread spectrum lecture briefly about code division multiple access, where uh, we're chopping up a uh, signal using a specific code. If, um, we have an orthogonal set of these spreading codes, then we can uh, assign a code to user one, a different code to user two, a different code to user three, and so on. And we can uh, support a number of different users talking simultaneously 
on that channel, um, but use the idea of uh, uh, spread spectrum to with orthogonal spreading codes to be able to isolate each one at the receiver. So, um, uh, Professor, yeah. Um, um, so, like uh, from a previous slide, it, it sounds like uh, the TDMA, um, FDMA, and CDMA seems very inefficient. Like, if you, I mean, you're talking about like one or two users, like, there's like millions and billions of users that are using simultaneously, right? right. So, right. If, you're, if you're delaying time or just chopping up the frequency, there's you need so many, right? Um, how do you yeah. attack that? Yeah. So, um, the, the, so we ran out of yeah uh, ability to solve this using just TDMA or just FDMA, right? Uh, as we started having more and more uh, users, uh, so the um, then then in three G we started relying heavily on CDMA to handle that. Um, and uh but we still kind of ran out of that so that is why we're motivated to look at more sophisticated approaches at this and one way is to simply combine both tdma and fdma and uh here we can have a number of different time slots but also we can have some different frequency slots and so now we can assign user one to maybe communicate over these frequency slots, but over just these three time slots, right? And then we'll give it over to user three and user four, maybe user two down here at different frequency slots and user five. And your uh, base station scheduler will uh, try to balance the needs of each of those users and give them uh, the best experience to all of those, right? And um, so it's a bit of an optimization problem uh, where you're trying to simultaneously uh, optimize uh, all these different users uh, under these uh, you know, constraints. And uh, so, these algorithms are typically held very, very proprietary to the base station uh, manufacturers and, and stuff. So, um, but basically during some frame of downlink transmission, the base station scheduler might allocate certain combinations of frequency and time slots to various users according to their current and predicted needs. Right, so this uh, might involve some difficult trade-offs in capacity limited systems as opposed to coverage limited. It's not quite as uh, uh, challenging, but it can be in in other ways, right? So, uh, but basically, we're doing a combination of uh, FDD or TDD or FDMA and and TDMA uh, type systems. So, um, all right, so that's still kind of a brute force kind of simplistic way. Now let's look at OFDM, which is a solution which handles this in a very elegant uh, and uh, somewhat optimal way, right? Um, we want to maximize the number of users operating in a spectrum. So how close in frequency and in time can we put them, right? So, um, well, if you think back on our um lecture on the raised cosine filter and inner symbol interference we kind of figured out that uh we can only send data so fast before we start uh uh running in problems with inner symbol interference right and uh when we have these multiple uh paths from uh receiver the transmitter to receiver we've got some reflections going on when we have a band limited system we've got uh you know our, our pulses don't look like clean uh square wave pulses going through the air they look like these sine x over x pulses or maybe a cosine uh a, a raised cosine type signal shape a uh, pulse shape and uh so we have these little uh, side lobes in the time domain 
uh, because of that, that can interfere with other um, other subsequent symbols, right? And uh, make it hard to detect those. So, uh, you know, we, we have some ways around that, but ultimately that does limit us, right? And uh, same thing in frequency, if you remember back uh, very near the beginning of the course, we looked at uh, frequency shift keen. And we looked at, um, we, we didn't go super deep into frequency shift keen, but we did talk about this idea that, um, well, we need a certain amount of separation of those uh, frequency tones that would represent one symbol versus another symbol as we're transmitting. Uh, and that's related to how fast we're sending those symbols, right? If we're sending them super fast, then we need to uh, spread them farther apart in the spectrum. And we're eating up more spectrum in, in doing that. It makes sense, right? Uh, if we want to, send, you know, Shannon's capacity theorem says that if we want to send data faster, more capacity, then we typically need more, more bandwidth at a fixed signal noise ratio. So uh, frequency shift keen, we, we ended up with this little kind of simple relationship of the uh, data rate and the factor of two and the frequency and uh, frequency spacing between the symbols, right? So, um, so we can kind of intuitively expect there to be some limitations on um, how close in frequency and in time we can put things in order to try to maximize, squeeze in as much uh, users and uh, traffic of those users as possible. So, um, Let's consider orthogonality, right? So we talked about orthogonality a few times. Uh, we looked at that uh, kind of early on in the semester and uh, it didn't go super deep into it, but uh, I did mention a few times that this concept is important in communication systems, right? And we've used it uh, uh, some uh, in the past. So let's consider two symbols, S1 and S2, uh, they're cosine, it could be a sign, but it's, you know, I just picked a cosine. And um, they're going to be, um, you know, symbol of uh, T is equal to one second long. And uh, I just drew one with the fundamental frequency of, of one hertz, right? So um, it's sending one, uh, one period during that time. And uh, so we could modulate this using BPSK. That, let's look at this blue line here, right? So uh, it starts at a positive one. Uh, if we wanted to send maybe a, a different bit, then uh, we would multiply this whole curve by minus one, right? And it would start here at minus one and go like that, right? So it would have the opposite sign or opposite phase that uh, binary phase shift keen, we've also called it uh, binary antipodal uh, type signaling. Um, it's really describing the same thing. Um, so, uh, but then let's also consider another symbol, S2, that has twice the frequency. So this first one had a frequency of one hertz. The second one has a frequency of two hertz. Now let's think about in a receiver, in a digital receiver, whether it's a correlation receiver or a match filter receiver, we're going to process it, either integrate or, or push it through our filter for uh, this period of one second for the period of that symbol. And then we're gonna sample it at, that, at the end of that time, right? So uh, whether we're uh, kind of convolving that in a, match filter, or we're integrating that in an integration uh, correlation receiver. We're gonna do something like this, um, integrating from zero to T. And uh, if we're maybe trying to receive S1, but we actually were sent S2, right? Then if we process this, we're going to see that this integration of these two symbols being multiplied by each other, we're going to integrate to zero, right? Um, uh, not going to derive that analytically. I think you can kind of see that uh, 
well, here uh, maybe they're uh, adding they're they're the same uh, sign at least uh, down to here at least, but then this one starts to go negative while the fundamental one's still positive. So there's some cancellation going on. Now there's a lot of cancellation going on. So uh, if you look at this as you integrate this all up, if you are doing this over these delta t intervals over and over again, this is going to integrate to zero. That's our essentially our definition of orthogonality. If you take two signals and multiply them together and integrate over a, a fixed time period zero to t, and if that's zero, then they're orthogonal. So um, what can we learn from this? Well, uh, you know, match filter designed for S1, we know that's optimal. Right, and we can um, uh, design a, a match filter for S one. It's that time inverse complex conjugate, but it you know for symmetrical real signals, it just looks like S one, right? And um, so we send an S one through that filter and sample it at the end of time t. We're going to get an optimal response, right? If um, uh, we send S two through that same filter, we're going to get zero because of this orthogonality condition here. And the same thing, vice versa. If we design a, a receiver to look for S2, but we send in S1, it's going to integrate to zero also over that time period. So that's orthogonality. And we notice that that occurred when we have a signal that's two times the frequency of the other one. Well, really, it's, it's any integer number of uh, integer factors of that fundamental frequency, right? So if we uh, start here with this blue one, and then, uh, gosh, where's the other one? This one, I guess, and then the red one, and then this teal one, uh, these are all uh, integer factors of that fundamental frequency. And they're all mutually orthogonal. So S3 is orthogonal to S2, and the orthog uh, S1 is orthogonal to S4, and, and so on, right? So basically, anytime N is not equal to M, they're going to be orthogonal. But if they are the same, then it's basically going to be that particular symbol squared. And we know that's our energy when you know we take that uh, uh, signal square it integrated over t, uh, uh, zero to t, and that's that's what we call the energy of the symbol, right? So, um, in the frequency domain, these truncated pulses are going to look like the sine x uh, over x is in the frequency domain. So, I just drew one here at uh, zero. Uh, frequencies are nominal here, right? Uh, uh, the carrier frequency. This might be at 100 megahertz or something like that, right? But uh, then we draw another one here uh, that's at twice the frequency. Um, and uh, here we're, we're uh, you know, looking at a baseband type signal, right? So um, uh, this one is uh, twice the frequency, and then we see that it reaches a null when this fundamental is at a peak, and vice versa, when this twice the frequency reaches a peak, this fundamental reaches a null, and so does the three times frequency. It reaches a null here, right? So uh, it's orthogonal in the time domain. Uh, over that zero to t interval, but it's also orthogonal in the frequency domain, and that if we're looking right at the center frequency of each of these, then uh, they're minimally impacted by it, right, by these others, okay? So we saw something similar to this in this uh, ISI lecture way back when, right? And um, so... Uh, using integer factors of frequencies, the peaks of each carrier align with the nulls of the other. So let's look at the multi-generation, multi-carrier generation of this orthogonal frequency domain multiplexing, right? So we're going to use different frequencies to carry multiple users, but we're going to uh, squeeze them 
to the point where we're just meeting this orthogonality condition, right? And um, so uh, we're, so originally I drew cosine signals, but we can also send J sine signals. Think of your uh, quadrature AM type modulation where we had symbols on the real axis, but then we also had symbols on the imaginary axis. And uh, so here we can have cosine and J sines. Uh, so we can use Euler's formula and uh, use an exponential there to represent both of those simultaneously, right? So, um, and we're gonna just keep things simple, assume that the, the fundamental has a frequency of one over T, right? So, or, uh, and so, um, this K now is representing these integer multiples of that fundamental frequency, okay? And uh, so let each of these cosines and sines be amplitude modulated via coefficient X sub K, uh, where that could be plus or minus one, okay? So uh, like if you're just looking at um, cosine signals that would be BPSK or binary anapodal, binary phase shift keying. Uh, but once we added those J signs in there, now we have a quadrature AM. Uh, so we'd have uh, plus or minus one on the X axis or plus or minus one or plus or minus J on the imaginary axis, right? So um, we can generalize this later to MRE type uh, QAM later, like 16 QAM or 64 QAM or or uh, 256 quam, that type of thing. But for now, we'll just look at plus or minus one. And so now, if we sum up all of these multiple carriers in this OFDM waveform, now uh, we're going to have N of them. Each is represented by K, while each cosine and each sine is represented by K, right? So we have... Uh, 2 pi k, k here is this integer frequency term that we're dealing with, right? And then uh, the, the time uh, and normalized to this um, uh, period t, right? And uh, so then each one of those has this unique, um, um, you know, coefficient that we're using to modulate it, right? So what, what does this look like? to you, what does that remind you of? The summation over some N of uh, some coefficients times E of the J with some frequency and time in it. What does that look like to you? Uh, Fourier transform. Fourier, yeah, Fourier transform, exactly. Good, good answer. So we're going to actually generate this with an inverse discrete Fourier transform. So technically, we're going from the uh, uh, frequency domain to the time domain. So it's it's technically an inverse uh, uh, discrete Fourier transform. Discrete because we're, we're dealing with these integer numbers and in a summation, and it's finite to n, right? And so here, what we can do is we can take all these different uh, subcarrier modulations coming in, and we can do an inverse discrete Fourier transform. If we have eight coming in, we'll have eight going out, right? So if you do an eight-point discrete Fourier transform, typically you are, we're dealing with 1,024, 2048, or 4096, but I don't want to draw that many arrows, so uh, I just drew eight. Uh, but if you have eight coming in, you do this inverse discrete Fourier transform, you're going to have eight coming out, right? These are all in parallel. Let's let's now convert those from parallel to serial and now send them over the channel and uh, then do the reverse. We do a serial to parallel. Now we have eight different uh, things here. So we're just, you know, when we do the serial to parallel, we're just taking eight lines and uh, sending them out sequentially on a, on a single wire, basically, right? So uh, in an ordered, ordered fashion. 
And so then we just reverse that process and create eight parallel lines. And then we do a discrete Fourier transform, the inverse of what we did on the transmitter. At the receiver, we're doing a discrete Fourier transform. Again, we get eight out. Now we have these eight different uh, uh, things. So this all came from this kind of uh, orthogonality of these integer frequencies, right? Uh, so if you remember way back, when you first started looking at Fourier, you probably did a Fourier series expansion first before you did the transform. And somewhere along the line, uh, maybe your instructor talked about how this is reliant upon an orthogonal basis function, right? So it could be a cosine or a sine, or in general, for Fourier, it's an exponential. Each one of those is orthogonal to the other in that Fourier series expansion. Um, you may or may not have thought a lot about it at that point, but that's really key when it comes here, right? So uh, we're we're wanting that orthogonality condition. It turns out that this Fourier uh, discrete Fourier transform provides that for us, right? So uh, we can generate the this waveform using a highly efficient uh, inverse uh, fast Fourier transform algorithm. So it's just just an algorithm uh, to do discrete uh, Fourier transforms, uh, but it turns out it's an optimal algorithm. And um, uh, then that can be implemented in an ASIC or an FPGA or DSP or even GPUs, right? And you can do that very, very, very efficiently. And so we're able to parallelize this whole uh, processing uh, process. So we uh, call each of these a subcarrier because this is you know ultimately going to be squished into one composite carrier, right? But each of these are a subcarrier. And this is all a linear transformation process. So uh, this subcarrier here then gets isolated as this subcarrier out here, right? And uh, we're able to extract each one of these um, uh, in isolation. So uh, we use typically, you know, because we like to use these efficient fast Fourier algorithms and they're most efficient when we use the power of two, then um, uh, that's what we, uh, that's how we size these FFTs. Uh, so uh, 1024, uh, 2048, 4096 are, are, uh, are common, common ones that we see in uh, LTE and 5G. Uh, each of these, each of these subcarriers can be modulated uh, using some MRE quant. And it turns out you can you can uh, 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 you know do them each individually, right? So uh, we might measure the signal to noise ratio across these different frequencies, and we might find that well, there's some fading in uh, one of these areas. I'm about out of time here, um, and so. Uh, if there's a fading in this frequency, then uh, we're going to have a poor signal to noise ratio. So we would might use BPSK, but in other areas we might have a really great uh, signal to noise ratio, and we would use uh, a much more bandwidth efficient uh, modulation scheme like a 16 or 64 uh, or even 256 quant. So. All right, um, I'll leave it there and we'll pick up on uh, on Friday. Sorry for running a little bit late. Have a good one, Doctor.